Should you buy a second home? How about a boat, an RV, a timeshare? No, these things are horrible decisions, but they're decisions your friends might make. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. So yeah, so what we're going to be covering today are uh, financial decisions, because I think we talked about this in show prep. We can't call them mistakes by themselves, inherently solo, but financial decisions that you hope your peers or those around you make. Well, here's the big thing. A lot of what we talk about on the show is helping our viewers, <laughs> listeners, not make the big financial mistakes that are going to derail their path to financial independence. Right. And I will tell you, a few of these things today are massive yep. things that very well could be mistakes if you don't have your financial order of operations right. That's right. So, but that doesn't mean that these things can't be a blast. So it is financial mistakes that you truly hope your friends or relatives will make so that your back pocket doesn't get punished but you still get to have the fun. That's it. That's exactly so, right. So um, to start off, there's a few house cleaning things we want to jump into. First of all, moneyguy.com. If you go to the website, you can sign up. Give us your email address, your zip code. Why do we ask for zip codes? We want to know where you live in the country in case we start doing some live things and right. find out where we have more than three people in one area did, listening. Did you just drop a nugget in there that we might be taking the show track. on the road? I mean, eventually. I mean, I don't want to. We're not setting dates yet. We won't be in your town May 15th, but. You know, definitely give us give us your your email address and your zip code. Here's the second thing: we're growing, as you can tell. We have a set now. We, we you know we're, we're adding listeners and subscribers constantly, so much so that we now need a money guy employee. So if you're a person, we're looking for an entry level position that can grow with the show. So if you're a person that's got um, an understanding of basic finance, mm -hmm. um, a hunger for you know good content, and then just connecting with the money guy family. We want you to reach out to us. Bo, what email address you want me to attach to this? Yeah, shoot me an email. You can send it to bo, B-O, at moneyguy.com. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, you'd be... Uh, it's somebody... We're not looking for virtual employees. We want somebody who's willing yeah. to Good either live in Nashville or relocate to the Nashville area and uh, would like to be part of this uh, this budding enterprise. Um, you ready to jump into this thing? Yeah, let's do it. So it's not hard to see out there in society, I mean, whether you go country music... You hear the song where Buy Me a Boat yep. or a Yeti 110 from one of my neighbors. You know, that's one of his songs. And then we got hip hop artists, you know, rappers have been really talking about their consumption lifestyle, lifestyle yeah. for, for decades. The thing I think is interesting is that as humans, we are hardwired to want to stand out from our peers. That's right. And a lot of times that can manifest itself in through consumption yep. because we want to buy stuff that we perceive will be fun mm -hmm. as well as make us stand out it serves, it serves from, a sort from of a everybody status else. Symbol. So I put together, here's a few of these that I know financially might not be the best for your back pocket, but they sure are fun. And the first one, second homes. Yeah, I, you know, this one is so funny to me because this is one that I feel like so often people tell us this is an aspiration of theirs. They will know that they've finally made it when they're able to have that beach house or that mountain house or that second home or whatever the case may be, rather than being like a symbol of not making good financial decisions, this is sort of the coup de grace of making good financial decisions, at least as far as Robin Leach would suggest to us. And I, and I will admit, I have fallen prey to this siren song. Mm -hmm. And I, I can share, I think that, remember, wisdom comes from experience. So it's good when you have some some decisions that might not have gone well. I think I even talked about this one in our financial mistakes episode uh -huh. recently. But here's why these things are a siren song. Let me give you the brochure brochure high points. Appreciating investment potential. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's real estate, right? So, you know, in real estate, no, obviously God's not making up. more of it right. unless you're in Hawaii. So um, that was my own little joke there at the end. <laughs> Unlimited vacations. Oh, if you own maybe. a if you own a second house, you can always go there. You're the boss. Rental income. Yeah, if you're only there part of the time, why don't you use that as a way to generate more income for yourself? Tax deduction. What is not to like about sticking it to our favorite uncle? That's the big one. And then, Bo, you wrote this one. Access to different weather seasons. Yeah, if you live up in the far north and you get like 22 inches of snow every winter, you may want to have that Florida beach house where you don't have to deal with that white stuff I think anymore. they get more than 22 inches. Yeah, I don't know. I'm from, I'm from the south. We live the south. We Three inches and we freak out yeah, down here. True. So that's why 22 sounds like a blizzard does. Um, 
So let's talk about this from a hard data fact, because I think a lot of them, you mentioned Robin Leach, mm-hmm. and he passed away not too long ago. Right. But you know, if you're a child of the 80s or 90s, you know lifestyles of the rich and famous. Yep. And there's so many things that are put before us by the marketers and the industry, the cottage industries that are convincing us to consume, 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 that we think the next decision you make in your path to success is probably doing something like this. But what do the actual numbers say for successful people? If you go look at Dr. Thomas Stanley's Stop Acting Rich book, Mm -hmm. um, this is the the data he had on second homes. 64% of millionaires never owned a vacation home, a beach bungalow, or a mountain cabin. So over one half of all folks chronicled More than half, more than 60%, 64%. And then listen to this. I thought this was, uh, this is why I kept this stat. This is from the first time we did this show. But I think it gives you perspective on what it got us into the real estate crisis of 2008 through 11, to 2011. Was, and according to the National Association of Realtors, Second homes accounted for four of 10 residential home sales in 2005. So that was before we had the downturn. And the typical home buyer was 52 years of age with a median household income of 80,600. Wow. That does not sound like somebody that ought to have multiple homes. It does not sound like the profile of someone who should be diving into a second large real estate purchase. I did because I, when I see old data, I like to go see if I can find newer data. Uh, it, it was interesting for me to see that if you look, second homes only account for about 6% of the total real estate marketplace. What is interesting though, if you, like Florida is a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Florida, California. I mean, it was amazing. You know, the, the, there was only a few states that accompany, accounted for accounted most for like of it, yeah. half of the second homes out there. So since you've seen the brochure, um, high points of all the potential appreciation, the rental income, the tax deductions. Let's get into the reality of the yeah. situation. And here's what I'll, I'll promise to sprinkle in here. I'll sprinkle in my own life experience in this a little bit too, so that you can hear the story and hear my, my woe tell on um, why you might need to be careful with this decision. So for a second home, let's talk about the buying. Yeah, so obviously when you go to purchase any sort of real estate transaction, there are transaction costs associated with that. There are closing costs associated with it. And if you're not paying cash for the property itself, there can be financing costs. There's an interest charge if you're going to own this thing over a long period of time. A real estate commission of 6%. I mean, the thing is, real estate is an illiquid asset. Mm -hmm. It is not something that you can get the whim of selling tomorrow and getting the cash. It just doesn't work that way. Even in a good situation, it takes time to turn it back into cash. Furnishings. Here's the thing about furnishings. When I think about a bed or a couch, you're thinking I can get seven years out of that, right? Seven and like yeah, mattresses, I think mattress, ten years is what they advertise years, yeah. on the on the TV. And when you're with rental property, because the re- problem with rental property is nobody treats it like it's theirs. They treat it like rental property. So couches last at most three years. Yeah. Beds, if they don't steal. You know, because they you'll put a waterproof mattress cover, but that'll get stolen in the first year. So it goes six months where people are sleeping on it without the waterproof mattress cover. So you're replacing the mattress yeah. every two to three years. It's just it's horrible how much it costs to get this secondary house yeah, decorated. And I don't even think about I mean, obviously if you have renters in there, it's gonna you have to replace stuff. But I think, you know, everyone I know whoever has bought a lake house, and even if they weren't planning on renting it, they just wanted their secondary house. They didn't want it to be empty. They still wanted every room to be furnished and they wanted to be decorated and they wanted to look nice when people came over. It's hard enough just to do that stuff for your primary residence and then you have to double that cost to be able to do it on a secondary residence. The price is certainly more than just what the sticker on the pamphlet says. Maintenance. Ooh, this is the one I think that you've gotten burned on the most, right? Um, Well, I mean, it ties into the furniture, the turnover of the furniture. But then the other thing, because we all, and you heard me say, a large portion of the secondary home market is in Florida. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is coastal. We all want to be near the ocean. There's this thing that, side effect of being near the ocean. All the air has salt in it. Mm -hmm. So everything corrodes a lot faster. You put a new light fixture on the back deck, it's corroding in just a few years. You put... Uh, a heat and air system on top of the roof. Because most is like a condo, where are the heat and air system? It's got to go on the roof. They're on the roof, yeah. so you have to hire a, a crane 
to pull this, put the, which I'm the crane sure that's is not cheap, cheap, right? To put it up on the roof, there's uh, maintenance is a mess, and that doesn't even count the additional costs of utilities. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? Another thing about a rental property, nobody treats it like it's their own when they pay them for utilities yep. too. They leave the doors open, they run the air conditioner, fifty degree air conditioning. I mean, they sleep five degrees colder when it's a rental property than they do at their own house. All that stuff adds up to to ongoing costs. Commuting. This is the thing. I have an annual golf trip that kind of started on the back of going down to my vacation rental property to do annual updates to okay. it. Okay. And then we'd play golf. That's how I'd lure some additional workers down there <laughs> with me is that we'd get a round of golf. Fortunately, now that we've gotten rid of the, 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 the condo, we can actually focus on having fun. And yeah. that's the problem, I think, with, with secondary homes – is that especially if secondary rental property that you think is in a vacation area, when you actually get to use it, you don't, you don't get to use it during peak times because right. you want the rental income. You end up using it during off seasons, and then a lot of times you're running around to Walmart, mattress stores. Yep. You do it running around to all kinds of things trying to keep up with the maintenance of it. Well, and you even you make a point about commuting that even if, if you are someone who maybe you live uh, in the northern United States and you want that beach house in Florida, you're probably not going to drive down there. Every time you do need to go for a repair or you do want to go experience it, there's additional travel cost where maybe if you had a different option, just go somewhere closer to home that was driving, you wouldn't have to pay for plane tickets or whatever the case may be. So it's an expensive endeavor just to get back and forth to your vacation property. And, and I, could, I probably have jaded this a little bit because of my own experience, because I've put this in there as more of a rental property sure. than just a straight up secondary home. But I know with renting, because we all think that we're going to make more money from a mm -hmm. rental property, the management company takes a huge cut. That's right. I mean, they're usually the ones that are coming out on the, 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 mm -hmm. the peachy end of the whole transaction. Um, and then when you do get tired of it, I know we had a lot of trouble. We had one of the, the owners of my condo. Um, they just changed in life. Um, there were some marriage changes going on, so they decided they wanted to get out of it. So sure. we all decided we went out. It's hard to sell. Yep. I mean, it just took a lot longer to sell than we thought. And once again, you're facing transaction, real estate costs, and all kind of other things that you just didn't count about count on. And then let's get back. I want to kind of close this out to that fool's gold of the tax deduction. Because yeah. I hear so many people think, I'm going to do rental property because I'll get a great tax deduction. Sure. And everybody hears, because there's articles all over the place that say that you can deduct up to $25,000 a year from your rental mm -hmm. house. The problem is, as soon as you make $100,000 of income up to a $150,000, that deduction completely phases out. So, so you don't even get to take it every you don't year get to when take you get it. it. You don't get to take it. It just sits there and accrues every year and essentially taunts you when you do your taxes until you actually liquidate that holding. So all of these losses are just building up in the background. So not only is it are there transaction costs is it, and is it sometimes uh, expensive to get out of or even difficult to get out of? You don't even receive the tax benefit if you're a higher income individual until you actually are able to complete that transaction. So a lot of people are then probably thinking, well, that's okay. And we'll get a lot of personal use out of this property. Problem is if you use the property for more than 14 days a year, you jeopardize some of the deductibility of all those expenses that I just talked about. Yep. So you can see that this thing is wrought with tons of booby traps and, and things that you have to be somewhat careful with. The advice I always, get, always give people is that the money is not made on the actual renting of the property. If you truly go get into real estate, it's, I think this is true with all real estate. It's all in what you paid for it on the purchase price. So yeah. if you got in at a really, like all the people who probably bought in 2009, 2010 during the market collapse probably did okay because the purchase price insulated so them yeah. on the intrinsic, it's all back to Warren Buffett's intrinsic value yep. discussion. The problem is if you're doing it for a cash flow, it's not going to work. But here's what does work. If you have a friend, if you have a relative that owns a beach condo, it's awesome to go use their beach That's, condo. I think about a lake house, someone who has a lake house with the boats and the jet skis and all the toys. It is fantastic to get to reap the rewards and reap the fun and joy of that. 
if you're not the one who has to foot the bill on it. Um, I'm still re- reading um, Jonathan Clement's book because we're going to have him on in, in not too distant future. And he talks about how it also creates a boring vacation because you're going to the same mm-hmm. place every year yeah. when you buy your vacation home. Now, I, I will tell you that actually garnered a lot of negative comments on Twitter when he push, right. published that because there are people that said that they built a lot of childhood memories and other things from – Going to a family That's homestead, right. but but to each his own. If you want variety, you probably don't want to own a vacation home. And we live in a world where there are some great alternatives to actually being a home. Because we say this all the time, Brian. Instead of going out and buying a second piece of real estate at the beach or in the mountains, add up how much it's going to cost for you to carry that every year. You could pay for some pretty nice vacations with that annual expenditure you're going to spend on owning the property. And with things like VRBO now, Airbnb. It's not as difficult as it once was to get to the beach pretty cost effectively. My buddy who does all the organizing for that golf trip that I used to do for maintenance on my condo, we, for the last three, probably four years actually, we have used um, VRBO and HomeAway, which are owned by the same company. Yep. You know, they're, they're the same ownership. Um, get some beautiful, con- I mean, we don't even do condos anymore. We do houses yep. that are pretty close, walkable distance to the beach, and it's cheap. Because it was off, it's kind of off season when we go to this right. golf trip in the early spring. So it, it's a lot cheaper. I can truthfully, now I get to split this with everybody that goes on the golf trip, which is a real sweet deal for me. When I was taking everybody down there to play golf, I was paying for it. Yeah. Because think about it, that beach condo was my you beach condo. You were covering it, yeah. So I was covering that to, to a large degree. So it's much better to, it's a very healthy alternative to consider renting somebody else's vacation rental. So it's so funny. So as Again, if, if you're someone who just listens to us uh, via iTunes or Stitch or something like that, and you're not watching the live streams, we do a live stream. We have a live chat going right now. Uh, one of the listeners has chimed in and said, hey, hey, what do you guys think about timeshares? Oh, man, you could not ask for a better deci- you know, transition point because guess what? If I just told you owning it 100% of the time doesn't work out well, how about partial time like a timeshare? That's actually our next point. But here's my thing about timeshares. I think everybody should have a healthy skepticism to any industry that is built upon high pressured sales Mm -hmm. and people who have to give you something to get you there. Like big giveaways to get you there. I mean, there is a reason that they'll give you park tickets or give you free hotel stays. They'll give you $150, $200 vouchers. They are they are essentially trying to get you in there so that they can then put the pressure cooker of, of, mm-hmm. of getting their high-pressure salesperson on there and then getting you to make a decision yep. that you might think is a good decision now, but will you think that same thing in five years, in seven years, in 10 years, in 15 years? Tom shares, I mean, now there's a whole cottage industry that gets you out of these things now. Yep. But they're pretty tough That's right. to break those contracts. There's a reason companies like Marriott and so forth have jumped into these things over the last decade. I mean, that's one of, you know, we get questions all the time, whether it's via the Ask the Money Guy series or just through the Money Guy website. And one of the questions we often get is, how, how do I get out of a timeshare? I have this thing I can't move away from. What's my way to exit that? A, a pretty big red flag should be if you're participating in something that other people know is really, really difficult to get out of. Um, I think these things have evolved. You know, when you first timeshares first came on the scene, you you were essentially buying weeks mm-hmm. in a in maybe a specified, um, you know, structure, building, camp area. Now they've gone to these point systems. Right. These point systems have added a level of complexity yep. that you almost need to be an engineer or an accountant. <laughs> To, you know, something in an analytical background to where you completely yeah. understand the administration, the research, the complexity. Timeshares are not easy necessarily to deal with all those points anymore. Um, and then I'd pay attention to the maintenance costs. I was shocked to see it's not it, the, a lot of your ongoing annual payments. Every year you're required to pay. Not only do you have an upfront cost with timeshares, you have an annual maintenance requirement. Those things go up. Yeah, it's not, static. it's not static in time. I mean, it is not something where you're locked in, and usually um, they go up pretty quickly. Yeah. So I mean, it's not uncommon to find out that your ongoing annual maintenance after you know a few years goes by 
gets to be bigger than what you could just go rent that same vacation for yourself, which is less than ideal when you're supposedly financing this thing to give you a great economic alternative to financing your vacations in the future. Yeah, one of the things that really bo- one of the things that really bothers me about timeshares is that when they're most often sold, like when they're pitched to you, is when you're actually on property and you are in the emotional high of how much you love this place and how much fun you're having and how much fulfillment the family's having. In a second, we're going to talk about some alternatives to consider. Mm -hmm. But one thing we get all the time when a client comes back and asks about a timeshare, or even when a personal friend says, hey, I just did this thing and you won't believe how good this deal is, I always say, okay, wait a month. Mm -hmm. Come back to real life, live at home, do your thing for a month, and let's talk about this thing. It's amazing how much the shiny, not, shininess and glossiness of that will wear off if you can just remove yourself from the emotion of the moment. That's the reason they make you sit at the seminars. That's the reason they try to sell them when you're on property. That's Truthfully, that's great advice about most things, whether it's new cars, anything that's shiny that kind of occupies your brain. Give yourself a little bit of time to digest the emotional side of the of the entire transaction here's the last thing i want to close it out on before we get to some alternatives for you to consider is that begin with the end in mind now we know that that is from the seven habits of highly effective people it's um it's also great advice when it comes to timeshares because if you begin with the end in mind you'll be thinking about the fact is if i buy this timeshare or buy into this process Am I actually buying into an obligation for my kids? Mm -hmm. Because it is hard. There's a reason. Think about this. That guy who comes on every morning on your cable news channel telling you that he's had so much success of getting people out of timeshares, he's obviously not doing this for charity. Right. He's getting highly compensated to get people out of timeshares. How bad is a scenario that you're willing to pay somebody enough money that they're advertising on morning TV to get you out of something you paid to get into. Be very skeptical of anything that's sold to you through high-pressured sales, and they have to incentivize you to be there that, that's just, it that doesn't add up. Yeah, that's a great point that you make. And one, you know, I have a, a wonderful client who, who I'm working with. And one of the things we were doing some uh, state document review for him. And he said, you know, he has these timeshares that he owns and he's paid for and, you know, ha- has the pieces. He's like, okay, well, I want to leave it to, you know, this, this group of people, you know, uh, siblings or nephews or friends or whatever. And I asked him the question, like, well, is that what, you know, is that what they want? Because essentially what you're doing by leaving real estate to multiple people is you're, you're sort of forcing their hand to go into business together and own something that they may or may not want to own. Right. So that's a big estate planning thing you think about. Even if you have kids and you have a vacation property or a second home, is that something that your kids want to actually own together when you're not here any longer? So it's an important thing that's to think point. about. So let's talk about what's the alternatives to consider. Now, you guys probably watching this are like, Brian dislikes timeshares. That's actually absolutely wrong. I love staying in timeshares. <laughs> I just don't want to own or be the one that's responsible for the financial obligation associated with that timeshare. Anytime I go to Disney, probably the last three times we've gone to Walt Disney World, I have stayed in a Disney Vacation Club property. Yep. I don't own a Disney Vacation Club property. Um, and, and the way I do it is there's this website I go to called dvcrequest.com. It's David's Vacation Club Rentals. And I'll just say, last time we stayed, like I was down there not too many months ago, we stayed in Bay Lake Towers okay. in a one-bedroom. They had two fo- They had the couch folds out into a bed. They have a chair that folds out into a bed. So both of my kids had separate beds. My wife and I had a separate bedroom. There's two bathrooms. So the kids had their own bathroom. We had our own bathroom. Had a washing machine. We had a full kitchen so we could have cereal or oatmeal before we hit the parks. It was spectacular. And you can do this. There's so many people out there selling points. Mm -hmm. And David's Vacation Club Rentals has made it better. I get nothing, by the way, for the. I get nervous about sharing this tip. Because you don't want everybody else to figure it out. I'm worried everybody (laughs) else is going to glut up, you know, the system so that I have harder times for myself when I like to go to Disney World. But it's definitely nothing wrong with Vacation Club property. Right. It's just you don't want to have all the financial obligations. There's another one, redweek.com. 
is um, a large online marketplace for timeshares where so, you can not only buy and sell them, but you can also rent them. So if I'm hearing you right, it's very easy in the world in which we live now. Technology has made it where you can enjoy all the benefits or a lot of the benefits of what a timeshare property has to offer without having to actually own it yourself and be the one that comes out of pocket for those costs. Now, they've gotten smart. Like when you go to the Disney Vacation Club rentals, they will have special fireworks parties or you know, dessert parties or something only for true Disney Vacation Club sure. members. But I'm okay with passing up on that elevator ride to the roof when I think about the fact that I'm not tied to that property other than that week that yep. I'm doing vacation. So that's a nice thing to consider. So it, it's so funny, man. Our audience, again, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I've got the live stream. I've got the comments coming. So then, right, one person said, hey, uh, what do you guys think about timeshares? Well, this other listener just commented, hey, you know, RVs could be a great alternative to a vacation home. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, we'll do we'll do RV. I'll put RVs <laughs> before the because the next. Let's talk about recreational vehicles and RVs fall into that. I think boats fall under that. You know, a lot of people. Here's what's in the brochure on RVs and why people like them. They qualify as a second home tax deduction. You yep. can take mortgage interest deduction on them. Um, but the problem is they depreciate like automobiles. That's right. so you might get a tax deduction like a house. They depreciate like an automobile. Unfortunately. They're not very fuel efficient. Right. I mean, they, these things still burn a lot of gas. Um, there's a good chance you're going to pay somebody to let you keep the RV there. Yeah, because most most places you can't just keep it parked in your front yard. I uh, can't keep it parked in your driveway. I'm going to pick on one of my next door neighbors. They've moved back to Chicago, so and I don't <laughs> think he listens to the show. He bought an RV in the last year or so, and I think and I I don't know if he'll follow this. As far as I know, he's only used it twice. Okay. I'm not going to say how much he paid, but it's not cheap. But I know he was paying $100 to $150 a month just to have it parked. Just to park it somewhere like that wasn't his house. Facility. And, I mean, it, it seems good on th in theory. I just don't know that that pull behind is going to add as much value. Because everything in the brochure looks better than it is in sure. reality. Because, you know, you have visions of your kids and the birds singing and the kids enjoying the campfire and you're telling some story when you were 17 and the kids all sitting there, you know, on their hands listening to you. <laughs> What's more likely to happen is your kids are going to be ticked off that they're in the same room in the back bunk area right. together. They're going to be pulling each other's hair. You're going to be mad. Burning that you, through your data. Yeah, I mean, it's just it, burning through your data because <laughs> that's what I had this crazy vision. I was going to rent a, an RV uh -huh. and go out to the Grand Canyon. Just, and my, my teenager was like, Dad, you'll hate me because I'll burn through the data before we <laughs> even leave the state. And she's right. I mean, she's exactly right. Um, and then the other thing I thought is that, sure, RVs are fun. We, we love Georgia football. Yep. Go See, dogs. We're both we're both bulldogs. I love you know if you can have a friend if you go down to, to Jacksonville for the mm -hmm. Georgia Florida game if you have a friend with an RV it's rock star a, it's good I living. mean it is rock star status any football game to tailgate and stuff like that especially with some of the the RVs that they have yep. at UGA but do you want to own it no you want your friend to have to clean the the black and gray tank after the weekend's over. Do you even know what a black and gray tank is? I have no idea what that means. Yeah, that's the gross stuff. Oh. Because what you think about RV oh, yeah. is all-encompassing. That's the black tank is the gross. Oh. The gray tank is what you're, comes out of the sinks, you know, like washing dishes and It's still and pretty stuff. gross. So it's somebody has to deal gross. with that stuff. I mean, that is all part of owning the Is it weird I've never thought experience. about that before? I've never thought about it. Where actually. did you think it goes? I mean, we've all seen Christmas Vacation. <laughs> I mean, we, we've all seen where he dumps it in the, the, you know, down in the sewer. I mean, it's, um, it, it's, not, it's less than ideal. It's better to build those memories in that friend's RV. So what's the healthy alternative to an RV? Cruiseamerica.com. You could actually rent. They have over 130 locations. When wow. I did this show a few years ago talking about RVs, I think they only had 110 locations. Yeah. Now they have 130 locations across the country. Go check it out. You can go rent a camper, an RV, and, and see if it's something you really like. And look, this is one where we have a lot of clients, and they say that one of their big retirement goals is they want to go get an RV and go around the country. And that's great. If that's a goal, something you want to do. One thing we always encourage clients to do, especially if they've never actually done that trip before, rent one and go on a trip to see how you like it before you actually write a check and pay for one. Uh, it's a fantastic, easy thing to do to at least test drive it, no pun intended, to make sure it's something that makes sense for you and your family. So this next one, but of course... 
I, I'm going to, we're going to talk about boats, but I got to get a prop. Hang on, hang on. Don't, don't get mad. Don't get Are mad. You, I'm coming right back. I'm did, coming right back. Did you know he was going off screen for this? No, I just, my memory on this cold medicine is so horrible that I had some great comments that I want to make sure I get them in here about this next one. So boat, break out another thousand. <laughs> This is from Michael. Okay, by the way. He might it. be, t I don't know if he's tuning in or not, but break out another thousand. We've all heard the joke that the two best days to own a boat is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. That's right. There's some, why, what, what's, what happens with all humor? There's a little bit of, a little truth, bit of truth in it in, in all of it to, that kind of makes it good. Um, and then here's something, I, I, since Michael gave me a joke, I'll give him a little piece of advice that he said that his father gave him. And you know who oh, Michael's know his father is. Um, he said, the advice he gave Michael was, you never finance a toy, and a boat is a toy, and it's an yeah, adult toy. Yeah, that's actually so good. So all that's these really things, you know, so it's, it's really good advice if you think about that, because boats, it, here, here's, the, here's the visual visual I'll give you. Think about it. They always have a brochure with some young, scantily clad woman right. that's on the boat with you. It's the best version of yourself. It's once it's the same thing as the RV. Just in the RV, they got the kids, you know, all looking all angelic. Everyone's smiling. But happy. on the boat, it, you know, you got this hot, you know, spouse with you. You're on the open water. It just seems great. I yeah. mean, you can practically smell the sea air coming into your nose as as you're on the open waters. Um, there's boat shows where they get you oh, excited about it. There's thousands, thousands of people come I mean, it's, from it's all just, over. But but the problem is, is they never talk about the cost of maintenance, mm -hmm. the cost of storage, the fuel. Yep. It's just all these things drag on you. And here's the stats that kind of blow my mind when you think about a boat. According to this is that same book, Doctor Thomas Stanley's Stop Acting Rich. Ninety three percent of boat enthusiasts are not millionaires. Uh, that's worth repeating. 93% of folks who would classify themselves as boating enthusiasts are not on paper millionaires. I can tell why you're freaking out is because when you think about the order of operations or the pyramid, pyramid of your financial life, a boat has got to be on the top of it's the like purchase. The, it's like the cherry. It's yeah, like you, at the you very get top. this only after you've accomplished all these other financial goals. But obviously, if 93% of boating enthusiasts are not millionaires... Somebody got the order of operations a little lie. out of kilt there. Um, and here's this. This will flip the script the other way. 70% of millionaires have never owned a boat. So 70% of those folks who were interviewed by Dr. Stanley, classified as millionaires, have never owned a boat. That's so, the majority of them. That's more than the majority of them. That's like the lion's share, but a sliver of 30% of them bought a boat. At some point in their life. It doesn't even say they're current boat owners either. It just, it says, just says that at some point they've made that decision. Um, you know, So it's one of those things where I, I think it's fun if you can have a friend or a relative who owns it seven days a week and you're just the friend that shows up on the Saturday or Sunday or the holidays and gets to ride in the boat. And all you have to do is throw in for gas. That's I would say that's yeah. a win. That, that, say by that's the way, win. that's another negative. I, I mean, I had a very, you know, one of my friends, his parents had a boat, um, boat house. I still have a friend in Georgia has a great boathouse that i love going to boats and stuff but the thing is the marina gas stations rip you mm -hmm. off it is not a deal so all your smart people who own boats have five gallon containers riding around their pickup trucks where they're they loaded up back home and, and then it put it in there that's how it's just it's just the gift that keeps on giving here's the alternatives to consider with a boat is boat clubs i mean if you're one oh, of these yeah. people instead of buying a boat that you go regret and have depreciation and all kind of things. Maybe ease into this decision by considering a boat club yep. where you know you can pay just a monthly fee, and then you also get access to more boats. And and that's only if you really have this itch so much. So, or maybe you're a wakeboarder or you're an outdoor enthusiast, and this just makes sense for you. Consider doing something like that. So you're renting that opportunity versus really chunking down a lot of money on and, on a lifestyle. Now, obviously, this this varies uh, depending on where you live and what part of the country you're in. But a lot of times, we've actually seen that the cost of boat club memberships is at is the same or less expensive than the cost it would cost for you to just house your boat at the marina. So you can actually have access to a number of different boats and different type of boats for simply what you would pay to keep your boat stored there. Because one of the things with boats, just like an RV, you got to have somewhere to keep it in most places. So this is the point of the show where if you listen to this show three, four years ago when we originally did it, that's where we ended it. But Bo, this is where you've added a little bit of extra flavor. Well, I like to do we what put, I can. We put some honorable mentions in here, and I thought this was pretty good. 
Um, we added, here's some other things, decisions you hope that your friends and family will make so you can benefit from. Golf club. Oh, a yeah, country, the club, country club, membership. club membership. A country club membership. Here's, I just did a quick Google search. The average annual cost of a golf club membership was $6,240, about $520 a month. And that's just the ongoing cost. Most country clubs have a big initial cost, right? They have yeah, this initiation, initiation fee. fee. Capital cost if they're doing renovations on the property or putting in new greens on the on the, the putting greens. Yep. Um, so that that's country clubs. It's much better if your friends are members than if you are. You know, I have I have a great friend, and he uh, you know when we used to live in Atlanta. He lived down uh, and had a country club membership for a golf course down there. And I used to love that I could always go as the plus one and get to pl- pet get to play, pay to play, and I didn't have to pay the annual or the monthly dues. It was a wonderful benefit. Now I will tell you, um, once again, this wisdom comes with experience. I lived in a golf community. Mm-hmm. It was one of those things kind of like you go through your scale of operations of what success looks like in your brain. And I thought being a member of a golf club was part That's of that. That's when you know you made it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy how society creates this con- consumption based upon what you think successful people should do. I joined a golf club, and it was one of those things where the initiate, I paid an initiation fee, then had ongoing monthly expenses – and it was fun for that season of my life, but you feel like you had to. I sometimes played golf, not because I wanted to play golf, but because I was trying to get my cost of fun yeah, ratio. Trying to get up. your money back out of it. And I probably I didn't spend that time with the family that I yeah. probably should have. And I'm not picking on my golfers because I love a good round of golf too. But it's just that that money, I mean, is it the best use of that money? And truthfully, golf clubs are struggling right yeah. now a little yep. bit. It, it is something that that is that is having a little bit of trouble. I thought this one was – well, uh, before I get to that, season tickets. Yeah. We put this one on here. Here's something. I did a quick search trying to find some financial data to share with you guys on season tickets because we love – both of us were season ticket That's holders right. for our Georgia Bulldogs when we lived in Georgia. I, I was going to say, you know, I've been pretty fortunate that I've been able to miss a lot of these mistakes that you've, you know, kind of done. I've fallen I into watch a lot of these. Yeah. This is one that I hit. Uh, the season tickets is one that I had as well. The problem with season tickets, especially like a team like Georgia where – you have to keep renewing your tickets mm-hmm. and you have to make a charitable contribution to get access, to get the privilege. To get the privilege to pay the for the tickets. The privilege to keep paying for the tickets is that um, you want to keep your tickets. So you kiss, you stay on this, this treadmill yep. of the process even when you find out that you're no longer really going to the games or what if you start having – now we've had two really good seasons. That's right. Go Kirby. But um, I've had some a lot of seasons with Georgia football that I was paying – a lot of money for these season yeah. tickets, and this you just there wasn't a lot of market yeah, value to right. these seats, and that's what because we're talking about college football. There's actually research out there. SeatGeek does research on the value of NFL season tickets. Okay, there's remember there's 32 NFL franchises. Their research showed from and this is back from 2015 on um, that they pulled this that 10 of the 32 NFL franchises, approximately so a, third, a third. Okay. You actually be better buying tickets on the open market than you would buying season tickets. I mean, so it'd be more doing, cost effective to buy. That, that's what their research wow. showed. That it should not work that way. You should not be benefiting from just buying on the open market versus getting the insider advantage of a season ticket. But it makes sense. But look, there's a lot of folks. I mean, we you know we're here in Nashville now. We have some dear dear folks that we love who are huge Preds fans, and they have Preds season tickets, and they will swear by them, and that's awesome. We have some employees that are fun, and, that but, resemble that, and and maybe. Again, it's order of operations. Does it make sense? Are you buying that in the appropriate order of operations? I still stand by. One of my favorite things is when I have friends who are the season ticket holders and they invite me to go to games. That's exactly right. Or work for a company that has season tickets. Yeah, even something. better. Because then there are even better seats. And maybe they come with Lexus Lounge the, where you get free drinks and food off of it as well. You see all of that our That is empo- winning. All of our employees just ran into the window right there yeah, and said, yeah, wishing, we need yeah, company so, season tickets. Um, the last thing, you put this one on here, Bo, and I thought it was pretty good, was that it is fun that they, it's not only buying things or season tickets or boats or so forth. We talked about how, like I've mentioned, like if you go on to Las Vegas, mm-hmm. it's fun if you travel with somebody who enjoys the gambling more so than you so that you can watch their highs and That's lows right. and not feel like it. I will tell you, I had last year, I had a college trip where all my college buddies, we haven't seen each other in forever. We decided we'd go meet up in Vegas the problem now, all these guys are pretty successful. 
So I was thinking, man, we're going to get out there and we're going to have a good time. I was, and I'm not a gambler. I will tell you, I'm much more equipped to run a casino than I am to gamble in a casino because I'm looking for the $5 tables. If they have something less than a $5 table, and that means going down to downtown Vegas and watching them (laughs) spin carnival things, I'll do it because I'm that cheap. I was the gambler out of this group. (laughs) So a gambling trip when nobody gambles is not a good trip. So that's why it is nice if you're going to do some of these thrill-seeking type vacations or other things. It's nice if if you're not wired that way to have somebody who is. That's right. So that it kicks up the fun uh, of the experience. That's kind of an honorable mention. Yeah, if you can have someone who has a higher risk tolerance than you to kind of make it exciting, uh, in my opinion, that's a lot more fun because it's a lot more fun to – be able to uh, pat them on the back and say it'll be okay than be the one that's getting patted on the back. Now, I know a lot of you are going to watch this show on YouTube and then you're, we're going to get some negative comments because you're going to tell us that your grandparents had this boathouse that you had some of your best childhood memories at and now you plan on doing the same thing with your kids. There's going to be, I know we have an employee that's going to tell us her predator tickets are the best thing in the world. And I'm not wrong. I'm not, I mean, you've kind of already said this. I think everything on this list could be priceless. Yep. And we have shared that it is much better to buy experiences than it is to just go out and buy more toys that op- occupy your garage, your closet, and end up in Salvation Army at some point. Right. So I'm not shooting everything down. I think the biggest thing we like to tell our viewers and listeners is make sure you have your priorities right. Yep. Everything in your financial life should have a plan. Your army of dollar bills needs to, you need to be, you need to be a good field general mm-hmm. and a good field general creates a plan. So not a single dollar is wasted or lost without a purpose. And I'm worried that we heard there's a lot of people out there financing lifestyle That's of right. boats, of RVs, of second properties, of timeshares. When they don't have a plan of action for that army of dollar bills, That's what we're saying. We're not here to pick on all of these things as, quote, all financial mistakes. Some of these things really could be great for your family. Just make sure you're checking all the boxes, going through that order of operations, and being successful with your financial decision making. That's. Let me give you even go a step further. Homework. Go out there and look for our financial order of operations yeah, episode. That's a great episode to go listen and, um, to. And maybe we even can link to it, and it will be a great way for you to kind of have um, a, a resource, a tool to help you make the right decisions for your financial life. That's right. So, guys, as you can tell, we have a lot of fun sharing this type of advice. We um, we hope that you are the person. You've reached so much success that you have all these and more in the fact that not only have you reached financial independence, you have enough success that you could go buy the boat, go buy the season tickets, go on golf trips with your friends and still need a financial advisor. But you're going to get to a point where all that decision-making, all those toys, all those decisions are going to need somebody to have, give you a second opinion. When you get to that point of looking over your shoulder and you want to make sure you're doing it right, we want you to kind of remember the, the money guy team, you yep. know, bound wealth and the abundant cycle. We give you all this free advice. The only thing we ask you to do to pay us back is when you get to that level of success, reach back out to us and give us a chance. So I'm, one of the things we're about to do is that after, at the end of every uh, one of these live sessions, we're going to do a Q&A. Uh, we're going to answer some questions. If you're someone who's out there listening in iTunes, you're checking us out on Stitch or iHeartRadio, come to one of the YouTube live sessions. You can actually see what our faces look like when we make goofy expressions. Uh, you can watch Brian go off screen, come back on screen randomly. You can see our bloopers. Uh, you can, we don't have any of those. This thing is so pure, so clean, none of those. Uh, and then one of the most fun things we do is at the very end of the show, we answer your questions in real time. So if you have financial questions or you want to ask us about, hey, I'm thinking about this timeshare, should I do it? Or how do I know when to do Roth or pre-tax? We're here to answer those. So if you haven't checked out a live stream, come check it out. Uh, start asking, and sometimes we even send free stuff out. We, oh, even give, sure. we even give some things away sometimes. So go register on the website, check out a live stream, and just thank you for being part of the Money Guy family. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hanson, moneyguy.com. <laughs>